get why people wouldn't like this movie. Because it's a lot. It's centrally a lot. The story is obviously not linear. It's like a Russian, actually somebody referred to it as a Russian nesting doll. Like there's, there's a story within a story within a story. And that can take you out of it a little bit. But I, I, I don't, I kind of liked it. <laughs> You are about to enter the courtroom of the Honorable Judge Kenny J.D. Does she have any movie critic experience? No. Does she have any authority? No. But they gave her a show anyways. The movies are bad. The cases are good. The rulings are final. This is in defense of... Hi! And welcome to the season finale of In Defense Of, a More Butter production. I am your host, Kenny JD, your judge, if you will. And on this here podcast, thingy doogie, thingy majigger we do, I talk about movies that did poorly in the box office or got bad ratings and decide whether or not they deserve them. Ayo. So like I said, this is the season finale. Oh my God. And it's been wild. This is our second season. We've been through a journey together. We've learned the ropes. We've learned, um, I'm getting emotional. We've learned so much. I've watched so much garbage <laughs> and it's been such a fun time. I gotta say. So today, we are talking about a movie that you guys have been asking me to watch quite a bit. And I I vaguely remembered this coming out and I thought that sounds like something I'd be into, but then I never watched it. So here we are, uh, 11 years later. Yeah, 11 years later, finally watching Sucker Punch 2011, a psychological fantasy action film uh, directed by Zack Snyder his first film based on an original concept. So before we get started on that, let's talk a bit about the accolades. Side note, apparently I say accolades wrong. <laughs> and apparently everyone I know also says accolades wrong. Is that an, is that a, is that just a people I know thing? Because I asked people, I was like, hey, they're telling me accolades doesn't have an L in the front of it. Like it's not in the beginning of it. She was like, no, accolades, that's how you say it. And I was like, apparently it's accolades. And she's like, huh, accolades, accolades. Accolades doesn't feel right. So apparently maybe it's either a my friends thing or it is a locational thing. Someone sound off in the comments. How do you say accolades? <laughs> Anyway, the accolades of the film. So even though the film content wise wasn't really a shining star, it would seem, uh, it did get a lot of recognition for its visual effects and of its fantasy sequences. Sucker Punch received a nomination at the 2011 Scream Awards for best special effects and its stunt work was nominated for a Taurus Award. The film was also pre-nominated for an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. The film stars Emily Browning as Baby Doll, a young woman who is committed to a mental institution. As she collects items she needs to escape, she enters a series of fantasy worlds where she and her fellow inmates are strong, experienced warriors. Sucker Punch participated at Comic-Con 2010 and showed the first footage of the film. Speaking of which, incidentally, I went to my first Comic-Con this past weekend. Uh, by the time you're seeing this, it would have been the weekend before. And I think, I don't know. Um, and it was actually a lot of fun. I don't think I'm a convention girl. This is what, <laughs> what I'm learning. That is too many people. It is too many motherfuckers in one room. And what's wild is like, Comic-Con, it's like comics and anime and, and video games, you know, all this nerd shit I'm really into, but there's something about there being so many fucking people in a room that was sensorily overwhelming. The lines for chicken strips, shockingly large. <laughs> Someone tried to cut in front of me and the only reason I didn't start a scene is because apparently that wouldn't look good. YouTuber Kenny JD fights a 15 year old for cutting in front of her for chicken strips at Comic-Con. How embarrassing. <laughs> so I didn't do it simply because of that. But I saw you, you little bitch. Comic-Con, it was fun. I, it was a lot of fun stuff going on around it too. So it, it was great. 
great to see creators, always fun. Anyway, so the trailer was released on July 27th on Apple Trailers, which is something I've never heard of. <laughs> and the second official trailer was released on November 3rd and was attached to Due Date, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part one, and Black Swan. I have a booger, sorry. <laughs> This shirt is dirty anyway, so it's fine. Oh, very attractive, <laughs> very womanly, very feminine. Anyway, on February 15th, Titan Books released the official art of the film book full of pictures to mark the film's release in the following month. So at the box office, uh, Sucker Punch grossed $19 million its first weekend, an opening that placed it second behind Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Roderick Rules. It also opened in 23 markets that weekend, standing at sixth in the overseas box office with $6.5 million. The following weekend, it dropped to seventh place in North America with 6 million, but fared better overseas where an expansion to 16 more countries led to a $11.5 million gross, which topped the international ranking. Sucker Punch eventually grossed 36.4-ish million dollars domestically and 53.4 abroad. Uh, leading to a worldwide total of a little under $90 million. Critic reviews has it at 22% on Rotten Tomatoes and audience around 47%, which is lower than I would expect. Or is it? Hmm. Anna Pierce from Bitch Media. I love, I love a, I love a brand that really gets, gets to the core sentiment. Uh, is, is that uh, Sucker Punch packs a pretty strong wallop. I enjoyed a lot of it, but I wish someone had warned me that a lobotomy was going to be a major plot point. Very fair. Andrea Gronval, Gronval from Chicago Reader. Gun-toting hotties combat assorted villains and their robot henchmen in this tawdry repellent action fantasy. William Goss, film.com. Schneider likes to think that his Russian nesting doll of a concept is enough to excuse its hollow center. Jim Shimbri, The Age, Australia. Heaven help us if we're ever supposed to feel guilty about watching hot chicks kick ass with guns ablazing, especially if the spectacle involves fire breathing dragons. I will, I will preface my dip into the synopsis by saying this, this movie is all over the place. Um, <laughs> Remarkably so, but in a way that I can kind of get behind. It's a little pussy. I think it, I, cause I, after I left the film, I didn't really know how I would feel about it. Uh, for reference, I'm not a huge, that was another thing I noticed at Comic-Con. I am not, I am not as much of a nerd as I thought I was. Like I'm not really into to like superheroes a whole lot, except for Catwoman. I'm not really super into like dragons and fantasy per se. So, um, and that tends to be like a lot of focus for some people at Comic-Con and like nerd culture in general. Um, so I didn't know what I was going into cause I thought this movie was like a superhero movie. And in a sense it is, but it's not like, Obviously it's not like based off of a comic or something, which I kind of wondered, um, cause I had never heard of Sucker Punch. There's a lot about it that is just like, fuck it, it's a fantasy movie. Don't even ask about logistics. Why do you need to know logistics? You're thinking small. That's my stomach growling, holy shit. I'm gonna have to eat after this. <laughs> You're thinking small. You're thinking in the realm of possibility. Cut that out. And maybe if I weren't an earth sign, that would be easier for me. Anyway, synopsis, close your eyes, open your mind. You will be unprepared. Facts. Uh, <laughs> Zucker Punch is an epic action fantasy that takes us into a vivid imagination of a young girl whose dream world provides the ultimate escape for her darker reality. She has been locked away against her will, but baby doll, Emily Browning, has not lost her will to survive. Determined to fight for her freedom, she urges four other young girls to band together and try to escape their terrible fate at the hands of their captors. Led by Baby Doll, the girls engage in fantastical warfare against everything from samurais to serpents with a virtual arsenal at their disposal. Together, they must decide what they are willing to sacrifice in order to stay alive. But with the help of a wise man, Scott Glenn, their unbelievable journey, if they succeed, 
will set them free. There's a lot going on in this movie. Um, I think rather on purpose or accidentally, there's a lot to talk about in regards to like misogyny and women doing w entertainment work, sexual or otherwise, to escape their prison disassociation fantasy. And I think there's, I don't know how much of that was like explicitly meant to happen, but I kind of fuck with it. And so the more I think about it, the more I think I kind of fuck with this movie. Is it all over the place? Yes, but the world is. See who can be deep. The costumes were cute. I think people tend to dislike things that are inherently feminine. I've talked about this before. I think that's one of the big reasons why people don't like Catwoman. Is she too hot for you? Does that bother you that she's really hot? Fuck you. I like to see hot women do hot women shit. It wasn't a very satisfying movie though. And I'll get to that cause spoiler, it's not a happy ending per se. Today's episode is sponsored by our friends over at Factor. Everything great about meal prep and none of the work, none of the cooking, none of the planning, none of the weighing. It's, it's meal prep for the lazy. I love it. Factor delivers healthy, balanced meals to your doorstep that all you have to do is take them out of their sleeve and then warm them up like a TV dinner, about two minutes. That's fantastic, okay. Reheated salmon. Always a hit or miss situation. That is fire. And you have delicious, fresh meals that you don't have to think anything about. I particularly really love a factor meal for lunch. Lunch is one of the most neglected meals of the day for me. It's just kind of whatever. And allows me to get a healthy meal instead of resorting to getting food out or having to do all the work to cook in the middle of the day. Like who wants to do that? It makes following your particular goals much easier. They have meals that are keto, calorie smart, chef's choice. That's the one I do where they kind of just give me all over, like a balance. They have vegan and veggie options. All of them are delicious. Personally, my personal favorites are anything with salmon because I love salmon. Actually, after getting my package for this integration, I ended up subscribing with my own money <laughs> afterwards. I was like, oh, this is a game changer. I don't have to cook at all. I don't have to chop nothing. Don't have to dirty no dishes. Faster than getting in my car to go get food. It's faster than waiting on delivery. And it's significantly healthier. I'm actually in the middle of one right now. They also have add-ons where you can add on like breakfast or smoothies. So if you would like to check out Factor, head over to go.factor75.com slash morebutter60 and use code morebutter60 to get 60% off your first box. Big thanks to Factor for sponsoring today's episode. This is the movie. So a young woman named Baby Doll is committed to a hospital for the mentally insane by her stepfather to stop her from talking to the police about how he murdered her sister, okay? Their mother had just died. She was their, I guess their last barrier between him and the kids. There's also some implication that he may have murdered the mom um, and, and abused them prior to that, but he bribes an asylum orderly named Blue Jones to forge psychiatrist Vera Gorski's signature to have baby doll lobotomized, which was very intense. That was a lot. Okay, and baby doll takes note of four items she would need to escape. Baby doll slips into a fantasy where she arrives, where the asylum is actually now a brothel um, owned by Blue, who in this world or in this imagining is a mobster. And the patients are sexual entertainment, whether that be dancers or, you know, sexual entertainers. Baby Doll ends up befriending, I can't say that word today, befriending <laughs> some of the other patients slash dancers or however you see them in this fantasy. Um, Amber, Blondie, Rocket, and Rocket's sister, and star of the show, Sweet Pea. And in this fantasy, the psychiatrist, Dr. Gorski, Gorski is a dance instructor. Blue informs Baby Doll, her virginity will be sold to a client known as the High Roller, who is actually the doctor scheduled to perform her lobotomy. Gorski has Baby Doll perform 
an erotic dance during which baby doll fantasizes she is in feudal Japan meeting the wise man. The wise man is a figment of her imagination, I suppose, somewhat of her intuition that will lead her into figuring out how to escape the brothel slash asylum. He gives baby doll weapons and tells her that she needs four items to escape, a map, fire, a knife, and a key. Other than the named items, there is also a fifth unrevealed item that only she can find, which would require a quote unquote deep sacrifice and bring a perfect victory. She fights three samurai giants, then finds herself back in the brothel, having impressed Blue and other onlookers via a dance. After that, Baby Doll is able to convince them, the other girls that she has befriended, that they can all work together in order to escape. Um, all they have to do is somehow get each of the men who are hiding each of the accoutrements that they need to leave, uh, distracting them with a dance by baby. It would seem that each time they acquire each item, um, her dance takes us into a fantasy world in which she ventures into great missions of war and, and combat, which are very, Confusing on <laughs> the first look through is wild. Uh, one of them was like uh, one of the world wars. I want to say World War One, fighting German soldiers to gain a map. Like in the real world, it's just Sweet Pea going into uh, the room where the map is and copying it. <laughs> but in this fantasy, they're going into straight up. Uh, World War I Germany and shooting already dead soldiers. <laughs> it was a lot. There's also orcs. <laughs> Why not? Okay, I just realized how much more confusing this is trying to explain it. Okay, in the real world, she's a mental health patient. In the fantasy world, she's in a brothel. But within that fantasy, she's also having fantasies of war. <laughs> and not just any war. War with uh, World War I German zombies war with orcs, war with fire breathing dragons and robotic guards. It's real confusing uh, upon first look, but I could imagine subsequent watches would be a bit more easier to digest. But the first time I was like, why, what are we, what is happening? Anyway, each of these times she enters into the, the, the fantastical war of different sorts. She gains one of the things that she needs to escape. The key, the map, the fire. But during the last fantasy to get the knife is when things kind of go crazy. So during the last fantasy, Rocket sacrifices herself to guarantee Sweet Pea escape from the bomb's blast. And this is paralleled by how in the real world, Rocket gets stabbed by the cook while trying to protect her sister. So while that's happening, unfortunately, Blondie's a dumb bitch and decided to tell the psychiatrist about the plan to leave, but guess who overhears them? Big bitch Blue. So Blue overhears her. So now Blue goes into the room, confronts uh, all the girls after locking away Sweet Pea. I don't know why, I guess story progression, but I'm like, he ends up shooting uh, Amber and Blondie they were trying to escape but they were all trying to escape so i don't know maybe because sweet pea is technically an understudy i don't know he then tries to assault baby doll but she stabs him with a kitchen knife and steals his master key baby doll is able to free sweet pea and they start to make their escape after after causing a fire that occupies the orderlies as they try to make their escape but once freedom is there in their grasp they see a throng of men block their way and baby doll deduces that the fifth item she needs is to actually sacrifice herself and that this is actually sweet pea's story and not baby dolls baby doll distracts the men long enough to allow sweet pea to slip away back in the asylum the surgeon has just performed baby doll's lobotomy gorski notes that during her short stay the girl stabbed an orderly started a fire and helped another girl escape the asylum the surgeon asks Gorski why she authorized the procedure and Gorski realizes that Blue had forged her signature and summons the police who apprehend Blue just as he attempts to assault Baby Doll. 
As he is being arrested, Blue also incriminates the stepfather. Sweet Pea is stopped by the police as she tries to board a bus, but the bus driver, the wise man, misleads the police and lets her board. During the end credits, Dr. Gorski and Blue sing Love is a Drug as the five female leads dance. And that is the end of the movie. So I get why people wouldn't like this movie because it's a lot. It's sensorily a lot. The story is obviously not linear. It's like a Russian, actually somebody referred to it as a Russian nesting doll. Like there's there's a story within a story within a story. And that can take you out of it a little bit. But I, I, I don't mind, I, I kind of liked it. <laughs> it's all over the fucking place. It's especially if you have no, nothing to prepare you for the viewing experience. I was just like, what the fuck? Like, I don't like to read, generally speaking, what a movie's about until I've already started watching it. So I didn't know what I was going into. I just thought it was like a superhero movie, which in a sense it kinda is. But I can tell that this, if you if you thought that you were going into something that was very linear and then you get stuck with a story within a story within a story, it can be a lot. And I think it can be overwhelming, but you know, I like it. I feel like they took a chance. They said, you're not gonna get the luxury of assuming whose perspective this story is told from. And I think that's kind of, that's kind of audacious. I kind of like it. Also, I'm biased. I really like the concept of a movie that obviously probably costs $80 billion to make um, <laughs> being led by women. Cause we like, generally speaking, women aren't given the opportunity to have that much money backing them. Yeah, the budget was $82 million. <laughs> so yeah, you spend all that money for other stuff. Yeah, spend it on some shit like this. Absolutely, I like it. I like the idea that there's several ways you can interpret the movie, that it's simply the story of Baby Doll and her trying to escape the asylum. Or is it that instead the story of Baby Doll is all a story within Sweet Pea's head um, as she imagines her friend who saves her in this great warrior epic story, this great sacrifice. Because Sweet Pea is actually the voiceover person of the story in the beginning, the narrator in the beginning of the voiceover person, <laughs> the narrator in the beginning of the, of the movie. You know, I think there's something to be said about the conversation around survival, the dancing to survive. I think there's something inherently, uh, is the word I'm looking for is sympathetic? I don't want to use that word particularly, but that's the word that's coming to mind. Sex work and how sex work is a means of survival. Sex work as a means of survival doesn't only exist within things like brothels and and uh, what we what we would deem as traditional sex work. There is an element of of sexuality being one of the only powers that a lot of women have to survive in general. I don't know if that was 100% on purpose, Zack Snyder. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I think this movie's kind of dope. And I and I can't help but think as per usual with anything that's pretty overtly feminine, I would say. I feel like people didn't like it largely because it was overtly feminine. I think it's misogyny. I feel like if this were led well, I don't even know how the story would look if it were not women being so central to the story. But if there were something Russian doll-esque, but a male lead, people would think of it more seriously. They would take the time to look in on it. They wouldn't just consider it a mess. But women led, they're just like, oh my God, there's so much going on. Fuck you. You better look into it the same way you would with any other male lead. Like, oh, you know what? There's something deeper here. There's something deeper here. Fuck y'all. <laughs> so I think it's innocent. I like it. I think I would like it more on a second viewing now because I've only seen it once. But I, I, when I left it, I was like, that's a lot going on. But I'm curious, what is the lot going on? It sounds like a lot going on here. There is. And I want to watch it again to figure it out. But as far as right now, I say it's innocent. Also the costumes, loved it. Loved the makeup, it was fantastic. The physics, questionable. I, one of my downsides I think of this movie is I don't love, sorry, I don't love Emily Browning in this. Uh, she's very, I don't know if it's just they wanted her to be like cool girl, stoic, no emotion, but I found her very flat. 
um, like emotion in no particular direction. And I didn't find that particularly helpful to pull me in. I found the other girls more interesting because of that. If they were to do it again, or if we could turn back the hands of time, I would have definitely switched out who played baby. <laughs> but other than that, the movie's fine. I think it's cool. I think it's fantastical and, and magical and also social commentarical. I make up words. And it was a fun time. So that's how I feel about you naysayers. Anyway, that is all for today's episode and all for season two. Accolades. <laughs> I've had fun. I hope you guys have had fun, discovered some new movies that might deserve your time, even though people said they were garbage or or had your feelings affirmed that they actually were bad. Um, I've, I've enjoyed watching some random films along the way that uh, I never would have really stepped into, really out of my comfort zone with films. So it's always been a fun time. But if you've seen Sucker Punch and you wanna let me know what your opinions are, feel free to put those down in the comment section. Fight amongst the jewelry. If you want to um, follow us here on More Butter, you should subscribe listen to us as a podcast that's also some fun time and also leave a comment down below about what your favorite episode so far of in defense of has been i'm curious but without further ado i've been kenny jd follow me on social media instagram twitter all of which youtube all of which is kenny jd and be sure to butter your popcorn <laughs>